Hello, Booktube. Well, I come to you from outside. <laughs> I'm in the beautiful Arnold Arboretum, a 300-acre nature preserve uh, just outside the greater Boston area uh, that was designed by the great Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Golden Gate Park and Central Park. Uh, and it was, it was commissioned by the city in 1871 or 1872 uh, to remain inviolate to just be a place of peace where many, many species of trees and shrubs and bushes, I'm sure that Caleb could identify them all, I don't know what any of them are, but also animals uh, could just roam in peace, and people too. There are paths all over the place here. Uh, I thought I would come here uh, just for a change of pace and also a peaceful environment uh, to do the next installment in our Presidential Library series, which has been greatly delayed. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and it turns out I had a presidential reason to do it. Well, I didn't really foresee that. I, I, when I got back from the morning's errands, I took a look at the news just to get a, an update on the horrible events unfolding in Charlottesville here in the United States where there was a Klan rally of large proportions with a lot of Nazis present. Uh, and uh, I wanted an update on the violence that, that erupted. A, a Klan member drove his car into a crowd of protesters and killed one of them. Uh, and I got all that, all those updates, and it just made me want to talk to you even more. And then I made the mistake of clicking on the brief address that President Trump made about Charlottesville. And uh, that was the wrong thing to do. That was the wrong thing to do. Because he condemned the violence on both sides. So he condemned the Klansman driving the car into a crowd of innocent people. And he condemned the innocent people. And he didn't name anybody. And he didn't say this won't be tolerated. And when he was asked if he wants the support of the white supremacist Nazis who were in Charlottesville, he didn't answer when the answer is no. Uh, and that, I shouldn't have watched it. I knew perfectly well what I was going to encounter. Any of us who reported on this piece of trash in the 90s knew just what, we know just what he is. And it's not going to make a difference, so because the, the U.S. Congress is not going to turn on him no matter what. And that no matter what now has a theoretical limit. This week we encountered the theoretical limit of that no matter what. It used to be that if you said no matter what, you were sort of hedging your bets. You weren't sure what they would do in the absolute worst case scenario. And this week we now have the worst case scenario in the United States. Uh, because this week we have a... a president who is a Nazi threatening nuclear war. That is the worst case scenario and the Congress is not going to turn on this president literally no matter what. That is the no matter what. If your president turns out to be a Nazi who wants nuclear war then you have reached no matter what status. <laughs> uh, and we have. Uh, I want to show you more of this but I, I just noticed that there are people here. I'm filming on the weekend. On a weekday, there wouldn't be any people here. So we'll try this again on Monday and see if that helps. Uh, but not many people. Uh, but anyway, I watched that address, and I really shouldn't have. And it soured my mood towards the United States and made me, paradoxically, all the more willing to come here and talk about presidents. <laughs> uh, and the president we have in mind today uh, is John Adams. We're up to number two in the presidential library. And the, the standard... Uh, line about President Adams is that he was the serpent in the garden, right? That he was, he was the anti-Washington. He was much shorter, he was two feet shorter than Washington, and he was not healthy, he was rotund, <laughs> his rotundity. Uh, and he was opinionated, he had, he had the uh, penchant for autocracy that, that runs throughout the entire Adams family. Uh, and not only that, but the, the thing that introduces the serpent into the garden is that unlike Washington, who professed, even though he was lying, not to like party politics, uh, Adams did have political enemies, and he made no bones about that. In fact, he rather enjoyed it. And so the standard narrative line with his presidency is that he introduced, the, he created and introduced the system that we now have, that we've had ever since. Uh, is, that, is that sun getting in the way? Is that going to help any better if we move that over there? Uh, it's still the Arboretum, no matter what. I don't know, I've got a sun over Well, how about that? Is that any better? I don't know. <laughs> we'll figure it out. This is only the first time in the Arboretum. Uh, and I'm trying to keep my hand away from the camera. Anyway, uh, so so we're up to John Adams, and with with John Adams there, like I was, you know, the lead up there was to to 
tell you what you probably already know, which is that no one has ever been tempted to hagiography with Adams the way they did with Washington. The thing we had to worry about with Washington, biographies, was the myth of Washington getting in the way of the man. There's no problem with that when it comes to John Adams, none whatsoever. No one's ever been tempted to lionize him. No one's ever been tempted to put him on a pedestal or make a president saint out of him. Uh, and that has the effect of making his biographies, I, I, I contend, that it increases the general quality of his biographies. Uh, it makes them more reliable, uh, just in general, because the, the authors aren't, they aren't fighting against that and they also aren't succumbing to it. So there's actually a large number of biographies that we could talk about here, but the, uh, the split that you want, it, with Washington the split really was uh, factual versus mythological. With Adams, the split is going to be much more common. It's going to be a split we're going to encounter from now on with only a couple of hagiographical exceptions. And that is a split between uh, what is odiously called popular history and scholarly history. I hate to, to invoke this division, but it is real and we do have to talk about it because it's going to affect whether or not you enjoy what I recommend. <laughs> uh, and the, the, the main difference, we can sum it up fairly easily. A, a popular history will be one in which almost certainly the historian is only relying on secondary sources. In other words, he has uh, as the disgraced British historian David Irving used to quip, uh, he has consulted the 12 previous books on his subject in his library and generated the 13th book from them. Now that's not necessarily as bad as it sounds, right? Any book is only measured by the person doing the writing. Uh, but it introduces all sorts of elements of uncertainty in any history, not just, not just presidential biographies. It introduces all sorts of elements of uncertainty. Did this author catch everything? Are they reproducing the mistakes of the secondary sources that they're using? Uh, and you sort of have to keep that in mind. It depends on how deep you want to dive into John Adams. So for instance, when we're talking about a biography of John Adams, of course the first book that comes to all of your minds is, is uh, one of the most popular presidential his, uh, biographies of living memory, which is the John Adams biography by David McCullough. Now David McCullough is a perfect example of a popular historian. He is writing for, you know, suburban college educated readers. He is not writing for scholars about his subject. Almost never. He abandoned that a long time ago and it's made him what, <laughs> what the publishing industry used to refer to as a pot of money. <laughs> so he's not going to change it anytime soon. And that again doesn't necessarily betoken poor quality. His John Adams biography is actually really good. And if you're looking for a smart, aware, one volume biography of John Adams, you can't go wrong with uh, David McCullough's John Adams. What I want to suggest in addition to that, I'm, I'm recommending it, but I want to suggest in addition to that a couple of other things. Uh, I, I want to suggest the previous uh, version of David McCullough, so to speak. The previous uh, landmark popular biography, which was by Paige Smith. Paige Smith was a great historian and a crackpot of the first water. And Paige Smith wrote a two-volume biography of John Adams that you will sometimes see at used bookstores. If you're lucky, you'll find it in the box. It was, it was issued in a box. Uh, and it's very good. It's very, very good. It's extremely readable. Everything that Paige Smith wrote is extremely readable. Uh, it covers the same ground as David McCullough, but in more detail. So you'll get you'll get a lot more of of Adams the husband man, Adams the husband, Adams the diplomat, uh, and a lot more detail into Adams' very controversial presidency, uh, in which there, you keep in mind the presidency was new. So Washington, Adams, they were they were pushing its boundaries and also creating those boundaries. So it's that's fascinating to read at any length. Paige Smith gives you more length but not necessarily a better book than David McCullough. So uh, so the dividing line is not, even so, between popular and scholarly. The dividing line between those two is simple length. If you really like reading about John Adams, but you still don't really want to dip your toe into the deep end of the pool, then find Paige Smith's two-volume book. I think it's out of print. I think it's long since out of print. Uh, find that and dig right in, because you'll love it. And then on the scholarly side, the slightly deeper, steeper side, the slightly less easy answer side uh, would be a great historian named John Furling who who did a one volume biography of John Adams that was just comparatively recently within the last 10 years reissued by somebody <laughs> I'll find out all the details and put it down below as I'm being I'm being extremely vague uh, but it's 
very good and a harder climb. You'll, you'll sense it right away. If you find it at the library, John Furling's biography of, of John Adams, you'll sense it right away that it's, it's a, a slightly steeper climb. That's what, that's what scholarly biography will usually read like. There's almost nobody left in the world who can write a scholarly biography that reads like a popular biography. Uh, it's tough to do. It's, it, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not belittling modern historians or modern biographers. It's really tough to do. Uh, so those, those would be my three recommendations. I would recommend, I do recommend David McCullough's one volume biography of John Adams. I also recommend Paige Smith's two volume biography of John Adams. And I recommend John Furling's book if you want to dive a little deeper. Now, of course, there are more scholarly versions than Furling. Furling was still, in his own way, a popular historian. Uh, he's just, I'm recommending him because you'll really like him. Uh, but you can go a lot deeper than that. But th those, one of those three books, or preferably all three of those three books, because we are talking about John Adams here, <laughs> uh, those books will tell you whether or not you want to go deeper. And that the going deeper is not part of the presidential library any more than it's part of the Western canon starter kit. Uh, these, these are just introductions to, to the really good works, especially the best ones. Furling's is the best stiff, slightly, slightly deep uh, biography of Adams, and uh, Paige Smith and David McCullough are absolutely fine, first-rate popular biographies of the man and his presidency and his time. Uh, and that's that's it. That's part number two of Presidential Library. I absolutely promise that this is not going to be an eternity before I get to part three, and part three is going to be fairly contentious, as some of you may already be able to predict. <laughs> but I, I will try to control myself. I will try to keep the polemics to a minimum. I'm sorry that I opened this video with one, but this is a very... there is no melodrama in saying this is a very dark day in American history. On this date in American history, an American president refused to condemn the Nazis. There's no way around that. That's not hysterical. That's not the progressive the prog left or whatever any of anybody might be tempted to call it. That is a simple fact. He got on camera, he's on tape, he's on video, and he's not doing it. You can't argue with that. You can't say that he did. He didn't condemn the Nazis. He didn't condemn the Klan. And he's president. So it's an extra residence, a resonance for uh, the presidential library, <laughs> and I will, I trust, I will have the self-control to leave that out of the next one. I'm going to try and get to the next one fairly soon, because there's no reason why we can't just give this little giddy app. <laughs> but in the meantime, I'll be back with other videos too, and I, I imagine I'll film them indoors, <laughs> although you never know. It's awful nice out here. <laughs> anyway, it was really nice to talk to you, BookTube. There are days I need it more than others, and I really needed it today. Uh, but we'll talk again. I'll see you soon. Thank you.